Um, thank you everyone for joining the BMRC today, our archives awareness panel. Um, we have this one today and another one on July 13th next week at two o'clock. Um, my name is T. Calvin. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the community engagement archivist for the Black Metropolis Research Consortium to do a quick image description, which I also ask of um, our panelists. No worries, Dino. Um, I'm a light-skinned brown person with short curly hair that's sort of fading away from a pink, um, brown glasses, orange shirt, and a black cardigan. There's a yellow wall behind me with um, a white door. Um, a little bit about what the BMRC is and what we do. We're a Chicago-based membership association of libraries, universities, museums, community and arts organizations, um, government organizations, and other archival institutions. Our mission is to connect everyone who seeks to document, share, understand, and preserve Black experiences. And it's our vision to be essential to promoting the discovery, preservation, and use of Black historical collections. Uh, one more people in from the waiting room. We run two main programs, the Archie Motley Internship Program, which provides hands-on experience for um, recent graduates or students of color interested in the field, and a summer short-term fellowship program that um, brings fellows to do research in our member collections um, and sort of share them with the public. Um, we also recently released a new archives portal that is a searchable database. Um, with Black historical collections and their information about how you can access them from institutions all around the city and suburbs. And we also have a resources page that has many things, including a legacy management resource portal and a workshop, workshop page with more information about personal archiving, family archiving, small organizational archiving, and basically how you can tackle legacy management yourself. Um, that's our short introduction about us, but I really want to get into letting our panelists share. Um, our first panelist is Skyla S. Hearn. I'll introduce her in a second, but if y'all have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, um, and we have time set aside at the end to answer them. So we'll get to them at the end, but you can pop them in as you think of them. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce Skyla. Skyla S. Hearn is a proud Chicagoan from the South Side by way of Oakland, Mississippi, Yellowusha County. As an archivist, liberatory memory and cultural worker, Skyla is most concerned with supporting a community's attempt to understand how to document and share its own history, particularly those aspects that have not been well recorded, celebrated, and included in overarching historical records. Skyla's passion and dedication towards the creation, management, preservation, and accessibility of archives, with particular focus on BIPOC, LGBTQIA plus collections, ephemeral materials, knowledge development, and social justice, has provided her with unique opportunities to work with diverse individuals, communities, and repositories at various capacities nationally and internationally. Skyla is co-founder of The Blackivist, a collective of trained Black memory workers who provide expertise on archiving and preservation practices to communities in the Chicagoland area, and the inaugural manager of archives for Cook County government under the offices of the president of the Board of Commissioners. As a legacy keeper, she recently, in March 2021, co-edited the zine publication, Our Girl Tuesday, an unfurling for Dr. Margaret T. G. Burroughs alongside Sarah Ross and Tempest Hazel, with an introduction by Miriam Kaba, published by Sojourners for Justice Press. Skyla holds a Master of Library and Information Science with a Special Collections Certificate from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, a BS Mass Communications and Media Arts, specialization in cinema and photography, Black American studies, and a recent graduate of the Civic Leadership Academy, Center for Effective Government at the University of Chicago. That amazing intro of such an accomplished person. I'll let Skyla go ahead and take it away. Thank you, T. Uh, <laughs> it's funny hearing your hearing like your bio being read and being in the room, you know, because I'm like, those were a lot of words. <laughs> but you know, all merited. And you know, so thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for the introduction. And thank you for having me and coordinating this wonderful event. And you know, I'm very happy uh, and honored to be here and in this space with you all. Hello. 
hello? Can you hear me still? Yeah, we can still hear you. Oh, okay. Um, so <laughs> I'm like, I'm waiting for my prompt. Is there a prompt? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, y'all. Ooh, I muted myself for a second. Um, there absolutely is a prompt. Um, the first sort of question was just kind of answered in um, my introduction to you, but if you wanna talk just a little bit about what the work you do in your current position um, and what that entails um, concerning archiving and legacy management. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I mean, you did prepare me, you prepared us. Um, I just had a moment where it just went blank. Uh, you know, these virtual rooms is still the same as a physical room, right? Like you get super nervous and everything just fades. Um, so thank you again. You know, of course, thank no you. problem. Um, well, yeah. So what I do is, or what my charge here is, is to create uh, an archive um, that is reflective of Cook County government. Uh, and, you know, I like to add the word, and not that I like to necessarily, but I mean, like, it's in truth that this position is an inaugural position. It's the first time that it has ever been done, which, you know, some folks are like, that's so exciting. And I'm like, oh, like, that doesn't even cover it, right? Like, I don't, I don't know if I've tapped into the excitement aspect of it, but definitely thinking in terms of, like, you know, um, the gravity of what this entails and so developing an archive an archive center for all of you know cook county government um and then also which includes you know representing cook county residents and for those of you know you all who don't know cook county is the second largest county in the country under los angeles so this is a massive undertaking um but i've been here for two years now and, you know, I can confidently say that I do understand, you know, what is needed um, and also the direction in which to take this. So again, you know, my main uh, role here is to develop the archives for um, offices under the president, Cook County government, and also, you know, to reflect the voices of Cook County residents. Uh, the second largest part to this role is to develop the bicentennial celebration, um, which is coming up uh, <laughs> soon enough um, in 2031, which commemorates the anniversary of um, Cook County government. Great, Skyla, thank you. Um, the next question is just about if you can talk a little bit about, in your own words, what memory work means to you. It's a term that not everybody might be familiar with, but obviously comes up in a lot of um, archiving circles and the work that we do. And so I was just hoping you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, you know, defining memory work keeps taking on like these um, different perspectives and understandings. And I'll probably misquote her, so I, I won't do it. But for those of you in the audience who I know love to conduct your own research, um, you can look up Stacey Williams's, um, Stacey Williams uh, definition of memory work, and it relates to uh, the idea and the fact that it isn't just, you know, something that is a responsibility of professional people to do that, like more so than anything, I think that there's more of a value that's placed on people who are doing memory work in communities um, and people who are reflective of the contributions that are happening right on the ground in their own families, you know, in their communities, in the movement work that they're doing. And I think what memory work really is, is the idea of implementing like different levels of preservation and sharing of maintaining, you know, again, the, the contributions of people um, who are um, maintaining the contributions, you know, of people. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, oftentimes, like in these um, professional roles, we think that it is only us who are able to then implement these practices, create frameworks and all of that. But the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, people have been preserving and sharing, like what has been happening, like within families, within communities, and of course, institutions, organizations for years. So it isn't just, you know, like professional people 
who are responsible, you know, for maintaining memory work because it's coming from us as people, right? Um, and with the focus on the fact that there's this other aspect of a resource that isn't something that is necessarily tangible in the way that say like things that we're kind of used to like paper source documents and things of that nature. But the idea of something being created and passed down verbally, right? Um, but the importance of placing, you know, um, the importance of sharing that and preserving that, right, is in terms of how I think about like memory work and how, you know, the actual practices are then shared by everyone who contributes, right, to, to creating this matter, creating these materials, you know. Um, so it takes it away from like this idea of like institutionalized work in particular. Um, where we all are, you know, responsible um, for like preserving, um, preserving all of our contributions to the point where it can all be included in what we all like to say, like the overarching, like, you know, historical like records, um, or overall historical narratives, right. Uh, and that's how I tend to think about it. And what brought me into the idea of thinking about being like a liberated memory worker, a liberated cultural heritage worker, is the fact that it's easy for me as a Black woman, as a person of color, right, um, as someone who is represented, like throughout, misrepresented, underrepresented, not represented at all in some cases throughout history, it's easy for someone like me to identify like where the voids and the gaps are, right, or either who is representing our groups and or misrepresenting our groups and also the importance of claiming and reclaiming and you know presenting it from our own first person perspectives so you round all of that up <laughs> and that's kind of like my response to you know like what memory work is the importance of memory work and who and how i feel it should be um preserved and implemented yeah, I appreciate you saying all of that. And it sort of feeds into the last question. If you want to just take a couple minutes to talk about a little bit more about legacy management and why it's important specifically for Black communities. Because we haven't had it. I mean, like we have, but in, but in a way where I feel that, you know, we have been talking to ourselves. So we've known all along you know, we know the value, but, you know, it's important to um, create systems. And I always talk about systems, right? Like, that's my jam, right? I'm, I'm your person when it comes to, you know, being the prototype and then like creating a template, which I feel that overall as an archivist, I feel like most of us understand that. But, you know, and I think, but when we build in who we are as people, into the work of like archival management, um, into the work of thinking about developing systems and frameworks and things of that nature. Um, you know, uh, we have to then, it's hard to extract who you are in your work, right? And I don't think that it's even necessary, um, especially when we're talking about just implementing like the most basic, like, the most basic things like, you know, open access, availability, like to things, but it's like, what are those things? What are the objects? What are the experiences, right? And so far we know what exists, but we have to create what we want to exist in order to develop a just society, which to me means, you know, um, providing the opportunity for everyone to have, you know, um, a place at the table and to be represented in truth um and also you know because what we're putting down is history history is happening right now and you know all of us are representative of a legacy you know um and i think that it's important when we're talking about legacy management legacy development we're thinking about the first person perspective so and again it's not necessarily necessary to extract who we are um, within the work that we do, but then also thinking about the missions, uh, the goals, the visions of the institutions for those of us who represent institutions, which I, you know, am in this conversation here with you, um, and having that to, to reflect the legacy of the institution all in truth, 
right? And also in terms of like who the players are, like who the contributors contributors are. And then also there's that part that's connected to it as well. When we think about who we are as individuals in the work, like in my bio, you know, the mentioning of our girl, our girl Tuesday. And that was definitely a part of like my institutional work um, in uplifting the legacy of Dr. Margaret Burroughs, because that's how I got to know her was in my development as, you know, becoming this person that I am as a professional archivist. And so, you know, I think that it is especially essential that we think of all of those components when we are talking about and developing like, you know, legacy management as Black people um, and also the way that that gets recorded into history because we hear it all the time but we really have to strengthen the meaning behind when we hear black history african american history is american history right like that's putting teeth behind that so you know <laughs> yeah. that's, that's why i think it's important right yeah I have so many thoughts, um, but I don't want to take up any time with my own thoughts. Um, and so I'm going to say thank you. Yeah, just absorb it because there's so much there. And I think so many people in our circles talk about it, but I'm just excited that everybody on the call is also getting privy to sort of the theories, the practices, the values that we're working with. Yeah, thank you. And, and also next time we need more time so you can include your opinions because we want to. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, great. Well, thank you so much, Skyla. Um, I'm going to introduce now our next speaker, Erin Glasgow, uses the same they them pronouns and is a Black, queer, non-binary, independent archivist and researcher based in Chicago, Illinois. Erin spends a lot of time thinking about how to meaningfully integrate Black queer feminist practice into their archival work and how to support the thoughtful documentation of grassroots movement work in support of police and prison abolition. They are also committed to helping preserve the rich variety of Black LGBTQIA plus people, sex workers, and disabled folks in Chicago and beyond. They're a founding member of the Blackivists, a Chicago-based collective of Black archivists who prioritize Black cultural heritage and memory work. The Blackivists received a Mellon grant in 2021 that has allowed them to support small Chicago-based Black organizations and collectives in archiving their work. And so Alex, go take it away. And I think you have the ability to share your screen already, right? Okay, great. Thank you so much, T. Um, I will give an image description. I believe you asked us to do that before we started speaking. So I am a uh, dark-skinned, Black, uh, fat, non-binary person. I am wearing um, gold hoops and clear eyeglass frames. I have short hair um, and I'm wearing a teal shift and there is, I'm in my office, so there's a white wall behind me. Uh, I think you can see the calendar that I have up. So just give me one second. Let me share my screen and we'll get started. I'm a Virgo, so I made a, I made a slide deck. <laughs> it's just kind of what I had to do. Um, <laughs> So, um, hi everyone. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for joining us for this panel. Uh, like T said, my name is Erin. I use they and them pronouns, and I am an independent archivist and researcher based here in Chicago. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited today to talk a little bit about my work and answer the questions that T posed to us. Um, and I also want to say many thanks to T Calvin and his team for coordinating this panel. Okay, so um, I wanna begin today with some grounding thoughts about my approach to archival work, and then I will uh, segue into the work that I'm currently doing. Um, I'll move on to sharing my definition of memory work, which aligns very closely with what Skyla just shared and um, why I think le legacy management is important for black folks in particular. Um, and then at the very end of this session, after Dino speaks, I understand we'll have some time for Q&A. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I wanna start with my archival values, the values that ground me in this work. Um, and there are many, but I picked four of the ones that feel uh, really foundational um, to the work that I do. And they, they really guide my archival and memory work. Uh, so the first value is a commitment to black queer feminism. So 
uh, this framework gives me really powerful tools and frameworks to recognize the connection between systems of oppression. Um, and grounding in this also reminds me of the liber liberatory nature of archives, guides me in my own ethics of care, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I also believe in the abolition of police, prison, and prisons and surveillance. Um, I believe that prisons, police, surveillance, they all harm people, especially Black folks, um, and also all of us who are marginalized um, and often criminalized by virtue of our race, our gender, our sexuality, our class status, ability, body size, immigration status, and so on. Um, so I, I just believe police and prisons must be abolished. And I refuse to work with police or other institutions who use um, sort of carceral notions of caring for each other. And I'm careful in my own practice to abolish the cop in my own head when working in community. Um, so the next value is compassion and care. So, you know, we live in a world that prioritizes overworking, um, individuality, and comporting ourselves in ways that follow the, in my opinion, very dangerous um, and unsustainable status quo. Um, so I reject all of that and I value slowness, being careful and following the lead of those most affected. And then finally, I have a, a foundational belief in autonomy and access. So it is my belief that every person, organization, convening, what have you, has the right to tell their own, their, to tell their own stories or not um, on their terms. Um, I also believe that folks deserve unrestricted access to information and resources that they need to take care of themselves, their families, and their communities. I'll say, so I will now talk about <laughs> my, <laughs> my myriad archival roles. So as a freelance archivist, I have a lot of roles and projects that I'm involved in, which is invigorating for me. Um, and it means that I get to choose the kind of archival work I wanna do. And I also get to choose how I want to be with people in that work. Um, so in terms of my, I guess, sort of more traditional freelance skill, uh, excuse me, freelance gigs, I'm a member of Shift Collective. Um, so Shift Collective is based out of New Orleans and it's a group of designers, archivists, historians um, who are all committed to helping to activate and support uh, the autonomy of community-based archives. Um, and the way that we do that is we try to help with funding and thinking through ways community-based archives can best sustain their own work. Uh, so right now I'm working um, as a consulting partner with SHIFT and I've been primarily doing project management work with one of the institutional partners, but I'm hoping to soon transition to more um, community-based archival work. Um, I also have had just the, the great misfortune, I mean, great misfortune, the great fortune of following, falling into um, film work. So I'm currently doing archival research for a film called Little Sally Walker. It's a documentary film project um, that is spearheaded by a Black woman whose name is Marta Effinger Critchlow. And the film is all about Black women and girls and them recounting the pleasure and power they found um, in their childhood play. So um, the archival and the archival research that I'm doing for Little Sally Walker primarily consists of me finding photographs and film, but uh, you know, it can be, it, it, it actually ends up being a myriad of kind of things. I've, I've found um, artwork that supports sort of the vision of the, the storyteller. I found um, sort of textual documents that also support the filmmaker's vision. So that's been very exciting work for me. I also had the opportunity to work on a film called Mama Gloria, which is a, which was about, or which is about Gloria Allen, um, who is, or who was, unfortunately, Gloria just passed away recently, but she was a black trans uh, icon, really, for lack of a better word, in the Chicago area. And I helped out with archival research on a film about her life. So yeah, that was just amazing. And I, I think for me, the wonderful thing about working as a freelance archivist is that, as I mentioned before, I get to 
to carefully pick and select the projects that I want to be involved in. And that has been um, really a lifesaver for me in terms of archival work. It's why I am still an archivist, because I have a lot of autonomy in terms of what I choose to do and, to, and what I choose to not do. Um, as was mentioned before, I am a member of the Blackivist along uh, with the fabulous Skylar Hearn. And we are a group of Chicago-based Black archivists uh, who are committed to preserving and uplifting Black culture here in the Chicagoland area. Uh, like my bio pointed to, we got a Mellon grant last year to support our project, which is called Diamond in the Back. Um, and that, pro that project has allowed us to give subgrants to Black individuals and collectives who are actively documenting their work. Um, just to give a few examples, we were able to partner with the Illinois Black Panther Party and getting some of their oral histories transcribed. We've also partnered with uh, the Lighthouse Foundation, which um, is based on the west side of Chicago. And so we were able to help, <clears throat> excuse me, help fund them to get equipment to document their annual Black queer pride celebration. So those are just two examples, but it's, it's really been, again, I think important to me to situate myself in the kind of work that feels most resonant. And I'm also able to do this in my work with the Blackivist. Uh, so we just finished up our, our the first year of the grant. We have another year to go. So I'm looking forward to all of the connections and partnerships um, we will make in the second year. I am also a member of the Fat Liberation Archive. So uh, this archive actually was just, um, just released. So for lack of a better word, just sort of unveiled. And it's a digital collection of the cultural and organizing history of fat liberation activism, it includes zines, um, articles, audio recordings, flyers, all kinds of ephemera. Um, and this project was spearheaded by the founders of a zine called Fat Girl, which was, um, based in the Bay Area, ran in the mid nineties by a group of fat, lesbian and queer, fat liberationist kinky folks. Um, and uh, and the, one of the things that I love most about being involved in this project is that I think for many of us who are involved in fat liberation, a lot of the story is situated firmly um, in the grasp of white queer feminists. And one of the things we are trying to do in this project is to tell a more accurate story which also includes the contribution of black and brown folks to fat liberation. So what I'm doing with them is I'm part of their archives committee, which is sort of problematizing and trying to think through um, what we wanna do next with the archive and also where it can be kept and thinking about sustainability of this archive. And I've also helped to transcribe some of the materials in the collection. And I, I just, I love it because it reminds me of the, the power of grassroots archival efforts. The folks leading this effort are not trained archivists, but they certainly have a vested interest in this work and, and this um, really rich archive being not only kept, but the information in it being disseminated. And finally, you know, my, my last gig is not technically an archival gig, but I, I sort of see it that way. So I do, um, accounts and event coordination for interrupting criminalization, which is uh, an initiative led by Miriam Kaba, who many of you may know, and Andrea Ritchie. And their project, this project aims to interrupt um, the growing criminalization and incarceration of women, girls, trans folks, non-binary folks, um, gender non-conforming people of color. So, and I guess the way that I frame this in an archival sense is that I think being part of a crew that is helping to create documents, host events, um, is archival work because it serves as a conduit or an activation point for more, for more folks to learn about police and prison abolition and also gives, a, a, our website has a section where people can access tools that they may need to uh, try to figure out some on the ground abolitionist liberatory campaign that they're trying to, to do. Like we recently released a curriculum that's helping folks who are thinking through all the really horrible legislation that's going on around trans youth. So yeah, and so I just, I, I, I words can't say <laughs> how much it means to me to be part of 
an, uh, an initiative that's doing such important transformational and I think uh, really fecund work in this moment. And they also pay for my health insurance, just full disclosure, which is real because as a freelance archivist, they're, they're, I don't necessarily have that safety net that other folks may have in institutional spaces. So um, part of their liberatory practices is making sure that we're all taken care of as employees of interrupting criminalization. And I, I mentioned them here because they allow me to do the kind of archival work that I wanna do because I have this, you know, this big part of our lives, this, you know, I, I'm guaranteed to have uh, health insurance for as long as I work for them. And I think that's a big deal and worth mentioning. All right, so what is memory work? So when I was thinking about this question, I was primarily, th primarily thinking about the what and the who. And um, yeah, so to me, and I, and I think it's really, I think not that memory work itself is nebulous, but I think having one definition for it is. So this is just how I see it, but I think memory work can mean lots of different things to lots of different folks. Um, so the first thing that I believe is true about memory work is that it's multifaceted. So, you know, the journals that we personally keep to the more traditional archival configurations that we see in um, institutions and late archives, I think all of that is part of memory work. So visual and also like visual art, architecture, performance, all of these things are key parts of memory work. So I think that memory work what it is is actually really expansive and I think maybe goes on beyond goes beyond our traditional no notions of what is archival. Um, I also think that it can memory work can be done by anyone it can, and it should be done by everyone. So yes, there are those of us who have been trained, but I, I firmly believe and I think Skyla also pointed to this that memory work belongs to the people and we are all participating in this project of creating and problematizing history. Um, and then finally, it informs our right to self-determination. So Audre Lorde said, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crushed into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. And I think that piece, that not being crunched into other people's fantasies of who we are is a crucial part of memory work. And finally, legacy management. So, the importance of legacy management, I think, cannot be overstated, especially for Black folks in this moment. And I turn again to Miriam Kaba, one of my idols, that our charge in thinking about legacy management as Black folks is that we must, we must document ourselves and write ourselves into history. Um, and I think having strategies for legacy management is always important but increasingly so in this political climate. So I think anything that tells the truth of anti-Blackness, massage noir, homophobia, transphobia, class solidarity, all of these things, the instances of where these occur in history, it's being, I think we are seeing folks that are willing to actively dismantle and attack. I think a lot of what we have tried so hard to write into history, um, I just saw an article yesterday about how Tulsa public schools are being audited by their, the governor's office in Oklahoma because they offered critical race theory training. So that means, to me, that means a lot of the valuable work that went into uncovering the truth of tragedies like the Tulsa race riot will likely not be taught in public schools. And of course, that's a travesty. So I think we are living in a time where I think it will be up to us Black folks to tell the truth of our communities, our triumphs, um, our struggles, and everything in between. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, yeah, I was just about to say about your question slide. Um, as we're sort of soaking in and appreciating what all of our panelists are saying, definitely remember to put your questions in the chat um, so we can get to them at the end. Um, thanks again, Erin, and also thanks again to Skyla. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dino. Um, Morris Dino Robinson uses he, him pronouns as the founder and current executive director of the Shorefront Legacy Center. Um, Shorefront collects, preserves, and educates people about Black history on Chicago's suburban North Shore. 
a graduate of Loyola University with a BA in Communication Design and a minor in African American Studies. Dino is current production manager at Northwestern University Press. Outside of his career in advertising and design, his avocation with the creation of Shorefront began in 1995 and has since accumulated over 500 linear feet of archival material illustrating the lives and experiences of Blacks on the North Shore for public use. He is the author of three books, Through the Eyes of Us, Gatherings, the History and Activities of the Emerson Street Branch, YMCA, and A Place We Can Call Our Home. Through Shorefront, he has engaged the local community in preserving its history through articles and oral history, provided resources for public use, and participated in dozens of lectures on the importance of community-based archives, use of archives to support social change, and general local history. And I'll pass it on to you, Dino. And I can also read the prompts if you need or if you are prepared with something, you can go ahead. Sure, thank you so much, Ken. I just wanna make sure everybody can hear me. Great, thank you. Um, and sorry for coming at the last minute. I have a 22 year old I had to go pick up. It was just chaos, always the case, you know, got something important to do, family comes into play. Um, I really appreciate being part of this group. And, you know, I echo, you know, Skylar and Aaron both on everything that you said. I think just the synergy um, and sometimes what I call an awakening of how we need to approach our archives and how we tell our stories and how we preserve our stories are coming to the forefront and, and purview of a lot of people. And understanding the processes in that is uh, quite important. Um, so I've been doing, I, I, I started Shorefront um, about 25 years ago as an independent uh, interest of mine. Um, I was working in advertising as an art director, but I always had this love for history. And I want to uh, share, um, you know, want to do something more with that. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. Um, make sure, can everybody see this? Yeah, we can see it. Great. All right, great. So um, I started Shorefront to address the situation where uh, local historical organizations in the Chicago Square of the North Shore were not capturing the local community, the local Black community. Um, those that did had captured in such a very broad stroke way that reduced the community down to we're servants and we go to church. And uh, that narrative was just, you know, for lack of a better word, insulting. Uh, especially for communities that have been around for generations. And how do you capture them? Where are those stories? People are still here. And why isn't this part of the collective history that we grew up with? And I want to kind of tackle that in a way that maybe wasn't done before. Uh, me coming from a background that did not involve archive or archive studies or librarianship. Um, I was in advertising, graphic design, digitization, uh, learning the software and marketing to people. So I kind of married some of that advertising skills that I had with how do you promote a local history? And that interest just kept growing into an organization. Uh, that established in 2002 and covered uh, seven suburban communities along Chicago suburban North Shore. One of the aspects I want to also tackle with, or I'm talking about local Black history, is that the focus in the Midwest, especially around Chicago, seemed to center around the Chicago uh, South Side uh, Black communities, and then everything else did not exist. So even you know to this day when I say yes, there are black folks in Evanston, in Glencoe, in Highland Park. People say in Chicago, oh really? We're up there too. So I need to put ourselves on the map. And what came from that was a, a just a engaged community of historical things that have happened that had impacted the Chicago metropolitan area that played a part with community members that lived in these areas. And we specifically focus on Evanston, Glencoe and Lake Forest in the, um, in the area because of the longer term 150 year plus presence of the black experience in those communities. Evanston being the most stable community in the area and just seen by this chart, chart here, the demographics we're dealing with with Evanston's total population and uh, compare that to the black population. Evanston has the far, by far the largest uh, settlements where in four of the suburbs combined, they have less than 800 bodies there and some areas are being reduced with um, migration patterns leaving the North Shore area. 
Uh, so I wanted to tackle where there was not a storyline that uh, the community can get behind um, that has always been excluded from the, the, uh, the, the local dialogue of uh, community assets, especially in a time where historic sites that were important to the Black community were being raised, were being uh, demolished, were being forgotten in history. And I want to jar everybody's memory that these things were here and our history should not be rewritten to think that we only live in a certain area and impacting only a certain aspect of history. And bringing it back to more of a collective general history as mentioned with Schuyler earlier that this is American history. We have a very specific focus on the African-American experience. And so we want to tackle that in a real way that brought to the forefront these histories and rediscover these family legacies of families that have been here for multiple generations and bring those storylines to the forefront. Um, but because of the work that we're doing um, for the last 25 years in uncovering these stories led to some really pivotal moments in how Shorefront has impacted the local communities and that of the greater Chicago metropolitan area and that of the nation as a whole. Um, we really focus and laser focused on what was mentioned before by both Skyla and Aaron about controlling one's narrative. And that is so extremely important uh, to Shorefront and to all of us that are here at this table. Um, when you have a community that's being interpreted by another community, uh, you find all kinds of discrepancies and mischaracterizations of uh, of communities that uh, focused on. And a lot of times institutions have fallen into that pattern of let's go into this community. We have this big grant to um, research this community. We're gonna write a white paper about this community and we're gonna interpret their importance for them. Without, and, and in doing so, what these institutions were doing were um, disregarding, discarding the intellect the, the, the ideas, the experiences that these communities bring to the table. They themselves particularly out of institutions, hold positions of power in their respective careers. They too have autonomy to tell and control their own narratives. And I wanna make sure that was brought back to the forefront. And we did that with some things that we've done with our programming here in, in Evanston. Two of them I wanna kind of highlight is uh, the uh, I don't know if you saw in the newspapers, uh, the work of local reparations in Evanston and how the city of Evanston, instead of talking about gener generating a report of how to study reparations and what should be done, the city of Evanston said, no, here's a pool of money we're gonna start working with and see what we can do with this and tackle all the things, all the harms that were done. What can we do? Putting all those questions on the table and testing the theories to see if they actually work or not. So we made headlines and part of their justification in actually putting money on the table was the reporting that Shorefront provided to the city of Evanston to help quantify why it's needed, where the harm was done, what specifically the city of Evanston has done against the black community to help mitigate this process. So as soon as I got the report, they had the justification needed and they released the monies and at this point, we feared um, any legal challenges. There have been some threats, but no legal challenges at all because it was based on sound reporting of what we were able to provide. In addition, we also generated a heritage sites program. And in many communities across the nation, we uh, see communities where they have uh, historic designated communities or heritage places. And they have these criteria that oftentimes eliminate uh, people of color to be involved in that. Unless there was a historic black community from day one, a newer community and an existing community, sometimes it's still left invisible. And in the case of Evanston, that was the case where we have uh, preservation districts that's based on architects architectural structure and based on the people who live there who've done some pivotal things in the in, in this community or nationwide. And usually the criteria leaves out the black community. Their house may not have been done by a famous architectural uh, designer or the person living there was not the you know, president of a major bank. So those are left out. So again, I wanted Shorefront to take lead and bringing that control back to the community. And we developed a heritage sites program that, it, that set our own boundaries and guidelines of how we designate a site uh, that is important to the African American community in a local setting. 
Uh, not only it's not based on architectural structure, it's based on the person or people who live in that home or that site or what that site was. And the city got behind that 100%. We developed a marker system that we impregnate these markers in, in the sidewalk in front of the properties, along with a interactive map on the website that helps flesh out the stories. And the judging for these sites are coming from the community itself. They have an open application, they can nominate a site, is vetted through community members, and then selected on an annual basis. And we just started this program over the last year. And the last thing that we're trying to do too is repatriate artifacts back into Evanston. There's a large contingency of, or as I said, our, our, our population, the black population in Evanston is declining and leaving the city of Evanston, leaving Illinois. And now I'm going to other states and talking to families who have once had roots in Evanston to help bring back some of those artifacts back into Evanston before they're lost in other states. Because on their passing, whoever's left there, they're gonna see all these items that mean nothing to the community they're living in. So they end up in the garbage. So we wanna try and grab some of these things and bring them back to uh, Evanston into a repository here where the community control and continue to add on to the narrative. And this is very important for us when I, you know, when you talk about community, how we engage with them. Shorefront does not want to be the lead storyteller. We want the community to be the lead storyteller. And we engage them in programs and, and practices that puts that ownership back on them. So we're not running that risk of we're in, interpreting a resident story. The residents themselves are telling that story. And our job is to find additional paperwork that backs that story up. So they mentioned uh, an existence of an organization, but they may not have paperwork on that. We go look for that paperwork. We develop a new archive and, and a new focus of, us, uh, of our archive to start developing so that that accountability is there and we can set the record straight. We can make it available for others to see. Um, so we go out and talk to people. Uh, ben Blount is an artist who's actually gonna be doing a residency with Shorefront soon, marrying his artistic skills with historical context. Uh, the Black Evanstonian History Makers, where we bring in two generational people, one young, one older, to talk about their life and living in Evanston and what they do. And we share that dialogue together, understanding that just imagine sitting at home at your dinner table and talking to your grandparents. What was it like growing up? We wanted that feeling of that in this casual setting, casual informal setting where the community is invited to engage with it. So they speak and the community has Q and A's afterwards and it becomes this really engaging uh, network of discussion that we later make available. Uh, we, as we talk about repatriatism into the archives back here in Evanston, for those who are a fan of watching Queen Sugar, uh, the character plays Aunt Vi and Vi's is Tina Lifford. She grew up here in Evanston, in fact, where I'm sitting in my home office, she lived two doors away from me right now. So I could look out my window and see her house. And so we were to bring her back in and get her back engaged in the community. And she's there sitting and standing in front of her front porch when she remembers as a baby playing on her front porch. And she's now bringing artifacts back to Shorefront's archives to add to the collection. And then multiple generational families that just come in and start sharing donations that they have brought in debt, uh, like. 15 years ago, and now showing the grandkids their family heritage. So those are things that we do as an archivist, as an archivist that's what we bring back into. And the part of memory work and look really hyper-focused on community and having a community own its own narrative. So we bring that purposely so we can start engaging and over-engaging and re-engaging family members to help build and add on to stories. So when we engage community members or a family, we don't just visit once and that's it. We're just a constant engagement with the family. Sometimes I'll visit someone and come back years later and revisit them again because we found some new information or we need clarity. And in this last picture here on the screen, this is a wonderful example of that where I interviewed this woman 20 years ago. And I remember her talking about she was part of a singing group in the high school. And then about 15 years later, another person donated a scrapbook when she was a teenager and she used to write articles in the Chicago Defender called Teen Scene. And a lot of it was all about Evanston teen activity. And lo and behold, one of the patients she had was that singing group that she said she was in, the Darnells. 
And I'm, I've photographed this while looking over her shoulder, she was talking about it. And it jarred so many memories that she had a whole new discussion about the singing group. This was her there as a little girl. And they pressed one record with Chess Records that was just lost afterwards. They were about to sign a contract um, and they ended up not signing because after high school, three of the girls married. Um, this is like in the early 60s. Three of the girls married, one moved to California, and the last person I'm interviewing here stayed in Evanston and just started a career. So the group didn't go anywhere. Um, I think the song, I forgot the name of the song they were singing, but that was just so interesting to hear that. And in tackling this, you know, in engagement, um, oral history is a big part of our repertoire. And um, we had so much that we did put together a website that helped share that information for the general public. So you don't have to hear from shorefronts. You can actually engage the families themselves, listen to their oral histories, and read their transcripts uh, along with that. And uh, that has become a very valuable resource for those who are doing research on things of reparations. How do you know this happened? Well, listen to uh, so-and-so on the uh, oral history site. You can hear their own personal stories when they're talking about Jim Crow and redlining. Uh, so we bring all that together. Right, yeah, to just wanna... Oh yeah, I'm done. I'm okay, done. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to wrap up. Cool. That, so. Yeah. Thank thanks. you so much. <laughs> yeah, and all of Dino's contact information is there. Definitely reach out to him um, if you're interested in learning more about Shorefront or his work. Um, I see there's a question already for Aaron in the chat um, asking, how do you become a freelance archivist? How do you find projects? That's this is a really <laughs> This is a really good question. Um, for me personally, it was my own, um, and you know, I want to I want to couch this appropriately. My own disdain for the art, uh, the institutional archival spaces that I had been in, I just didn't feel supported there, um, and nor did I feel like I was going to be aligned with the kind of work that I wanted to do. So that is sort of the why of, of why I decided to become freelance. And truly, I got started with one of those film projects that I talked about, Mama Gloria. And it was a member of the Blackivist, Tracy Drake, who is the university archivist at Reed College in Portland now, who said, hey, I have some, and, and at the time, uh, Tracy was working at Harsh. And she just said, hey, there's somebody here that needs help with the film project that they're working on. I don't have time to do it. Would you be interested? And I said, yes. And that for me sort of was the catalyst for getting involved in other sorts of film projects, which sort of carried me for a while. And then, um, and then, and then it was my work with the Blackivist that also gave me the chance to do archival work that I would be paid for. Um, so really it just got started because I had the idea that I wanted to try something outside of traditional archival spaces and also had a friend <laughs> who was kind enough um, to pass some work my way and get me started. Thank you. The next question is for Dino. Are the artifacts curated for Shorefront solely kept on the Shorefront site or are they also maintained by other institutions? All the archives that we have are maintained at Shorefront site. So we have about 500 linear feet of archival materials um, and it's growing fast, especially over these last couple of years through COVID, people are actually going through their things and donating to Shorefront. In fact, I just came back from um, uh, Georgia yesterday, last night. Um, and the night before at 11 o'clock at night, I picked up a cotillion gown that a cotillion that wore in 1969. That's something I've been looking for for 20 years when uh, documenting this cotillion group. And most of it I spoke to locally here had lost their dresses in floods, fires, or whatever. But, but this is a, a new artifact that we just got in. But yes, we do maintain our own archives, um, photographs, negatives. Um, we have probably over 250 uh, VH videotapes uh, that need to be digitized that we're working on a project with that. Um, yeah, and um, I think just for further disclosure, I do work at full time at Northwestern, so short front's my advocation. I do that on my free time. Thank you. We have a question I think is generally, so anyone can take it. We have a few minutes left. 
It's a big one. It says, how do you balance or do you ever feel a pull to reject the way oppressors demand we document? I know it's important, but BIPOC also rely on oral traditions and heritage in a different way that sometimes clashes with, uh, I think, what they mean traditional archival practices. Um, I could tackle part of that maybe, and I would like, uh -huh. please welcome anybody else. But that, I think that's always been an ongoing battle from day one with me specifically of, you know, you're, you know, short fund, you're doing this wrong, you have to do it in this model. And usually my discussion back is, well, the model is meant to exclude us and we have to rewrite that narrative and rework that. Yes, I see some commonality that's needed for uh, good synergy but we need to first address our own questions and our own way of doing things that are just as valid as what you feel focused. I mean, right now, if you look at all the, 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 the tagging and, and other categorizing, it's you know under transportation, arts and culture, and then you have African-American and everything's dumped in African-American. So now we have to recategorize what's important for us in a more broader sense. I sort of operate with uh, the thought that you take what works, what you need, and then leave the rest. So I think you know the question that you're asking, Sarah, is a really important one. Um, but and I and I think some sometimes the answer to your question is just the way that we go about the work that we do. But I also don't know if it's there are some you know archival standards that we learn that are helpful, right? If we're trying to preserve something. But I think sort of like I talked about. Um, uh, during my discussion is that I think we can reimagine and resituate ourselves um, and maybe the sort of relative importance that we have as archivists. And I think one way to reject the way that oppressors demand that we document is to put the people who we are documenting at the forefront. And I think that, because that's something that oppressors are not interested in us doing. So I think it takes a lot of imagination. And, um, but I think, it also takes the willingness uh, to be on, I think, as you're pointing to, to be honest about what doesn't work and try to point, um, point to and uplift the, the parts of archival work that we have learned, perhaps as professionals, that are more liberatory in nature. Yeah, and just real quick, I know that we're really close um, to ending the program, but to mirror uh, what both Aaron and Dino just said, in addition to adding on, um, the other part to that, Sarah, is thinking about like where we are within our positions within the field and how it is that we operate within the field. And for those of us who are a part of institutions and who are also in leadership positions in institutions, we have the ability to change things, right? Um, and just, you know, specific to the role that I'm in here, you know, I'm tasked with creating um, physical and intellectual infrastructure for an archival center. And so in this role, I can critique the ways in which we implement, you know, quote unquote, best practices and archival management frameworks and things of that nature, and then call out, you know, those areas which are very problematic and then not perpetuate the work that has, you know, um, happened in the past, uh, not perpetuate that into the future by upholding like oppressive ways in which we represent, build, create, manage, preserve archival materials and represent the people, you know, who contributed and created these materials. So there are always ways in which I think that we can push back, even if we're not in like leadership or management roles, um, you know, like whatever, as I mentioned, capacity we are like as archivists to then challenge these, these systems, right? Um, because people <laughs> created them along the line, so people along the line can also change them. Thank you so much, Skyla. I think those thoughts are a really great way to close out. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us and our speakers for sharing all of your insights. Um, the last note I have is just I put a link to a feedback form in the chat if you could please fill it out. It'll help us figure out how to do more events like this and better ones. Um, so appreciate everyone joining us and I hope you all have a really good weekend. To thank you, T.